The date is June 30th, 1996. This is the interview with survivor Alexander Karp, K-A-R-P, uh, name at birth was Sandor Karp. Uh, the interviewer is Susan Schreiber. We are in West Bloomfield, Michigan, United States of America, and the language of this interview is English. The date is June 30th, 1996. We are in West Bloomfield, Michigan, uh, United States of America. Uh, my name is Susan Schreiber, and I have the privilege of interviewing Mr. Alexander Karp. Mr. Karp, would you state your full name and spell it? Alexander Karp, K-A-R-P. Were you ever known by any other name? Sander Karp, S-A-N-D-O-R. And what is your date of birth? 7 25 Which makes you how old? 77 old. And where were you born? Hungary. Uh, in a small town by the name of Nir Mada, N Y I R M A D A. And where, what part of Hungary was that? That was the northeast part. And what kind of a town or village? It was. Uh, Small town, probably not more than 3,000 population. And out of what I would say 50 to 60 Jewish families. And what was your life like there? Was Truly, I don't remember it because at the age of six months, my parents moved to Kishwada. And what was Kishwada like? Kishwada was a larger community. Um, my father came from Kishwada. He was born in Kishwada. And uh, we lived there till 1932. Is approximately seven years, and um, I went to elementary school, went to Cheder. I started my schooling in Kishwada. At, w at what age? Um, uh, started as we call it kindergarten, but it was pre pre Hebrew studying. Uh, started at age five, then at six we got enrolled in Heder, what is the Jewish studies, and in a parochial regular curriculum what, it's, what it was being taught. You know, of course it was in Hungarian. You know. I was enrolled to that. So what would your day consist of? Like uh, we would get up in the morning and we would have Hebrew studies before we entered the regular school. And schooling went on till about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Once we were released from there, it was lunchtime. And after lunch, we went back to the Hebrew studies. It was a long day. Were you yeah. from a religious family? Um, everybody was religious to some degree. Now, uh, we would call it we were orthodox. I mean, we observed the Shabbat. Certainly, nobody that we knew who didn't have kosher. No. 
a holidays, sorrow days were observed, and uh, so I, 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 I can say that we came from a religious family. Who, who was in your family? What were your parents' names? Um, my father was Ignaz. Uh, my mother's name was Mariska, M-A-R-I-S-K-A. You said your father's family came from Kishvarda. Yes. Where, where did your mother's family mm. come from? At that time it was called Nir Bhakta, Nir Bhakta. N-Y-I-R-B-A-K-T-A. -A. Do you know how they met, or? Uh, I would say, uh, as in later years, I've heard it, that uh, someone knew someone who knew somebody else, and they said, there is a lovely young lady in that village. and. They had my father go over and meet the family, meet her. And that's the way the marriage came up. And what did your father do for a living? Um, at that time, my father was uh, a sales representative for Singer sewing machines. And did you have any siblings? Um, sister. What was her name? Marta. She was younger than you. She was four years younger. Do you have recollections of uh, some of the Jewish holidays or what Shabbos was like? Yes, I do. It's, uh, as I said before, every holiday was observed. Needless to say, we were waiting that uh, holidays should come as often as possible, because that was sort of truly what you may call a holiday. Nobody did much anything. It was the usual mornings we went to shore, uh, but it lasted till 12 or 1 o'clock. And after shore, the typical small town life, everybody went home, everybody was close, and uh, uh, winter time stayed inside, summer time you may have gone out and uh, you met on the main street, and primarily it was conversations up until four or five o'clock in the afternoon when you went back to Shul. Because uh, Shul was something, uh, what it created, it was, uh, it was the substitute of a, a country club. People met, and aside from that, it, it, it came quite useful and advantageous meetings, because primarily everything was centered as far as studying. Mm -hmm. And we took part in that. And as youngsters, just like every youngster, some of them are more, more boisterous than the other one. We had our fun too along with it. But everything was in between the criteria of an organized living. How did you, your family, get along with your neighbors? Did you live in a Jewish part of town, or? No, not necessarily. In a small town, people lived scattered. No, certainly 
if there was a rabbi or chazan uh, or a shaykhet or someone like them, they lived in the close proximity of the synagogue. But everybody else lived scattered. Naturally, the only commu commuting was by walking. Distances weren't too, too great. And uh, neighbors, we had gentile neighbors. As far as I can remember, all the time that I can remember to uh, to the time we have uh, we have been deported from Hungary, our neighbors were Gentiles. Do you remember any incidences of anti-Semitism when when you were young? Or? Yes, as as time went on, anti-Semitism became definitely more intense. In the early years, uh, I don't remember of having atrocities. No, when in the early 30s or so. But as a child, I can remember. You could never deny it that you were Jewish because everybody from the Gentile community reminded you of it, that you are a Jew. One of them approached the Talor bed more, more deeply with more hatred, some of them in a casual way. But uh, we were let known that we are Jews. No. When, when you did sports as a boy, did you do that? just with Jewish friends, or was that? No, I couldn't say that only with Jewish friends. Um, as a matter of fact, there was a unit, just like the, um, uh, it, it was called the pre-military, um, pre-military, how should you phrase that? They were trying to um, to have people prepare for the military, and for a while, Jews were permitted to be in that too. It was called the Levante, but it's a Hungarian name for this pre-military unit. For a while. We took part of it just like everybody else. But towards the mid-30s, as even, even at the beginning of the 30s, when all the hatred started to surface and governmental agencies were taking more part in deciding who is doing what, what is doing. And it didn't necessarily have to come from way above from the government. It was unilaterally decided by some of the people who were heading these organizations. And at that point, we had to leave these units, and we were totally separated. And once we were there, then we got the occasional youngsters who, who have, uh, there were attacks, there were beatings, there were fights, you no, know, and uh, just uh, we lived our days knowing that this is something that has to be an accepted fact. And as the 30s went on, what, what kind of changes did, did you see? Yeah, as the 30s went on, it, it became worse and worse with 
each month, each week, each year, and uh, life became a little bit more difficult. There was a lot of things that Jews have been excluded from. And uh, in schooling, in business, in whatever you did in your daily life, the change came rapidly. No. And uh, we just tried to adapt ourselves to the best possible way. And that went to our, for our parents, for youngsters in school. We couldn't do any more the same things as we did before. Because at, at the beginning, when I happened to be a youngster in the very early 30s, you know, we still mixed with the Gentile population. But as I'm saying, as the 30s went on, all the plaques started graffiti, you know, all over. It was eminent, and it was uh, something, but it was getting worse by the week, by the month, especially after Hungary announced her alignment with the Germans. Now, and I believe it was in 1936 when the Germans occupied Alsace-Lorraine. No. And whether it came through newspapers or movies, we didn't have quite that much, so we couldn't much see it. But circulars, newspapers have been distributed. And it started to spring up all the anti-Jewish anti-allies, anti-Western sentiments. Now, it started to become quite treacherous. And, and then what happened? Um, did this change your schools? Did your schooling become affected in any way? Or no, your our schooling at that point didn't get affected yet because we, we, we did have separate schooling. And of course, the Hebrew school, it was totally separate from the regular curriculum, you know, what we have taken, because we did have our own schooling. And as far as I can remember, I even remember his name. It was a teacher by the name of Grossman, who came from Mishkots, to the city that you have asked me about. But uh, um, the school by itself, or the schooling, was not affected, because we were totally separated. But the daily life became uh, more sensitive. Did your father's job change, or he was working for Singer? Please. Singer sewing machine. Now, in 1932, we moved from Kishwada, moved to a lower town, but it was near Bakta at that time. It was named as near Bakta. Now, and uh, my father at that time abandoned, or rather gave up the salesmanship, sales representation for Singer sewing machine. And he went into the same business as his father was doing in Kishwada, sausage casing. No. And that consisted of uh, getting the casings and uh, work it up, going to villages, there were small butcher shops, butchers, you know, and probably in a 20 mile radius. You know, we were collecting all these material and uh, 
made a very nice living. It provided a comfortable life for for our whole family. And uh, this was going on from 1932 till 1940. 1940, my father was drafted into the army. Mm -hmm. He was with the units, what it was called the border, border guards. But it was quite a, a an important unit in the military. And some of the people, some of the Jewish people, were still drafted in the army in 1940. But approximately one year later, you know, as the German influence started to take a stronger hold on Hungarian inner politics. You know, Jews have been started to be excluded from various different uh, areas in the civil or military life, such as schooling. We had the numerous clauses, but it meant to higher education you could only enroll 6% of the students who could be Jews. This, it was called, you know, it's a German word, numerous clauses. And um, it goes back even several years, because to step back in time, after the First World War, really, the Hungarians did not handle, didn't the Jews of Hungary in the same manner as they did prior to F World War I, when it was the Austrian-Hungarian monarchy. And Kaiser Emperor Franz Joseph was the head of this um, of Hungary. He was the emperor of, the, of Austria and he was the king of Hungary. After the First World War, as I said, things has changed, but it was still livable. No. And towards the 40s, certainly with Hitler coming to power and uh, continuously and rapidly deteriorating. Uh, it, it was getting bad when the forest came. They brought some laws uh, that Jews cannot be in the military whatsoever. Again, let me step back about two or three years. 1938, there was an election. That time it was still supposed to be a democratic government, but some of the parties were coming up, but it, and they are taking a very strong grip in, in everyday politics. It was elected a government, um, and the prime minister was a man by the name Bela Imredi, who was, who was a die-hard anti-Semite. The word was about him that he had some Jewish blood way back. No. And it was considered that people who have a Jewish blood and they became Gentiles, they hated more vehemently, and it was more deep-rooted their hatred towards Jews than an ordinary Gentile. No? And during his time, during his reign, a lot of laws were passed. 
but it was detrimental to the Jews. Now, as far as exclusions and, uh, and what you may do, what you may not do, and uh, it was a total deterioration of normal living. So, in 1940, your father was drafted, and he was in uniform. He was in uniform for the duration of that summer. Remember, it was May 10th, the day when he left. When he left our town, he went in um, where they were recruiting them, and uh, he was shipped out to the northeastern part of Hungary. Uh, that's where his, his regiment was detached to. Uh, it was a small town. It was called Kurosh Mezer. But it was right on the border between, at that time it was Poland, but already occupied by the Germans. No. And he was in there for the duration of 1940, and sometimes towards the end of the year, in 1940, uh, he, he was called back, and they, he, he was transferred into a labor camp. And uh, in 1941, you know, that labor camp was in the country, and they were doing various different things, whatever it was, uh, whatever it was uh, told to them to do. And uh, in 1941, when Germany and Hungary, the Axis, declared war on Russia, you no, know, it was. Correctly, June 22nd of 1941. Never forget that day. And uh, my dad was in the labor camp, as I said, in 1942. He was, uh, they were detached to the Russian front. Did your family know about this? Yes, yes. We knew about it, and we were still in contact with him for uh, for approximately about six months. This is the end of tape number one. This is tape number two of the interview with Alexander Karp. You were saying that in 1941 you still had contact <coughs> with your father. Yes, uh, occasionally. We would get some card or a letter from him, 41, 42, that was. And winter of 1943, he was in the Don Curve, as they called it, Don River, but it close to Russia. There's a Don Curve. He was stationed over there. And the big offensive started by the Russians, and his unit, his commando unit, was taken prisoner. They put them back behind the lines, and at that point we lost contact with him, and we haven't heard, heard from him since, till he came back in 1945. What was happening in, in your family and with well, you and your sister? That family? was, that two or three years was, really it was very sad years. First of all, the thought by itself, we didn't know whether my father is alive or not. And things have started to get rapidly worse in 41, 42. Um, I had to take command and do the work what my left, what my father left behind, because uh, 
over there they didn't pay for military. The only thing they may have given to somebody who was in the military or labor camps is uh, enough money to buy a pack of cigarettes. They didn't pay for it. Huh? So if you didn't work, you didn't eat, basically. That's what it was. So I took command. In the meantime, my grandfather passed away. My paternal grandfather passed away in 41. And then from 41, 42 on, I had to help out my grandmother too. And for a summer, I left what my dad was doing, and I went to help my grandmother out. And after about uh, a year, a cousin of mine who learned that trade took over the one what I was doing at my grandmother's place, and I went back to my mother, and I continued to do that over there. Where, where did your paternal grandmother live? Paternal. That was yeah. who you oh, went to my help that. Maternal grandmother lived in uh, near Bakta, but it became Bakta Lorandhaza through a merger of two little municipalities. Was that far from where your mother lived? No, it was oh. all the same. As my mother lived in Bakta Lorandhaza, so did I. And uh, my, her parents, but I, my grandparents, they also lived there. And your father's parents? Kishwarda. They lived in Kishwarda. Did you have a lot of family around, cousins? and? Yes. Yes, we had uh, quite an extensive family. My father had... Uh, four sisters and one brother, six of them. My mother, they had nine children, three girls and uh, six boys. Out of the six boys, five were in Canada. Um, the three sisters, they were in Hungary and the sixth brother also in Hungary with about whom I'm sure later around I'm going to talk about because he's the one I was with in the concentration camp. Now your schooling you had to leave school when your grandfather died? Um, yes. It was in 1941. In 1939, um, I entered the, the so-called high school. And I finished that two years later because I went into that high school with uh, separate exams whatever subjects it was needed to get into that class was the way the rules were. You had to have six elementary school, elementary grades, but it was compulsory. But from the fourth grade, you could uh, uh, six from the fourth grade, you could enter first grade high school. If you went all sixth grades with a separate exam in Latin, German, you, know, you could enter third grade high school. So you, you really had the diploma after two years as long as you had the eight-year schooling. No? So that's what I did, and 
I finished that. And that was uh, approximately 20 miles from my town. And every morning, we took uh, a train. Every single morning, had to get up 5 o'clock, walk to the train station, and by 8, 8.30, 8 o'clock, we got to that other little city where the high school was. And uh, this is the way it went our weeks. By the time we got home, it was most of the time for 5 o'clock. It was a pretty long day. Was your sister yeah. at this point, she was going to school? She was going to school locally, yes. Yeah. She was going into regular parochial school. And did she have any religious instruction? Um, not, not to a great degree, because uh, uh, other than on Saturday, they wouldn't ride a bike or anything to break the Sabbath, no? not openly anyway. But, uh, but girls didn't get any kind of Jewish, Jewish schooling or Jewish, no. So then in the 40s, what, what uh, happened? The 40s went on. It was uh, 41, 42, 43, 43, 43. We experienced of worsening situations, you know, fights, beatings. Confrontations became more often, more prevalent between Gentile and Jews. Um, organizations popped up where it was anti-Semitic. And it seemed like that uh, all ills, whatever problems that country had, it was put on the Jews' shoulder that everything is their fault. Every, they are the reason for anything what is bad. And it started from the heads of the governments. Um, we had a governor general, what it would be, who was Nicholas Horty. Openly, he wasn't much of an anti-Semite, but deep down, he condoned many of the things. And uh, probably deep down, he himself was, because uh, he came to power after the First World War. No? He was the one, how did he become prominent? Uh, he was the one who chased or who overpowered the communists uprising in 1918, no? So he became in power and uh, uh, in the early few years, things were not what you would call uh, heavenly, but tolerable. No. But as the German influence, as I stated before, started to take hold, you now, um, for whatever reason, you now it's very easy to give excuses. I couldn't help it. I can't help it. But nobody even attempted to help. No. And it came 41, 42, 43. Uh, our freedom was a little bit. Uh, curtailed. We couldn't do the things. There was traveling restrictions. There was, you name it, 
whatever it was pertinent to the everyday life, they had their ten fingers in it. You know. Then came 1944. You know. 44, March 19th, Germans occupied all of Hungary. Now, for the record, supposedly um, our Governor General supposedly wasn't for it. But they called him to a meeting into Germany. He left the country. And while he was in Germany, they had enough support, the Germans in this one, they had enough support, physical and, uh, and that the German occupation took place in two days, the whole country, without any, any type of resistance. Nobody tried it, nobody ordered that. And quite likely, uh, quite likely, they couldn't have done any way anything. No. But even if they could have, no, nobody attempted it. So in two or three days, the whole country was occupied. Do you have any personal memories of that time? Do you have any personal memories of when that happened? I remember the day. I remember as it was today. Describe. No. Um, it was devastating. By that time, I could grasp because I was 18, 19 years old, and uh, um, we have, for some time, we didn't really grasp the the seriousness of a German occupation. They have occupied Czechoslovakia, they have occupied uh, Poland, Lithuania, and it was from newspapers and hearsay. We weren't quite informed all the atrocities that was taken to its total seriousness, you know, didn't. But enough information came towards the, towards the latter two or three couple of years, and it was party because many of the Polish, um, some of them Polish Jews who entered Hungary and through Hungary, they were able to escape. Some of them got stuck in Budapest. Some of them found their way to Israel or to various different places. And uh, for a while, there was one prime minister who, even though it was known and it wasn't invited to do it, but they didn't act against it. They let them pass through. You know. So when the Germans occupied that, certainly uh, news started to surface that this is what's going to happen, that is going to happen. And it didn't take long before it was known that uh, they're going to gather the Jews in ghettos and they're going to ship us to factories to work. and and. Uh, it was very chaotic. Now, they weren't there too long. 
probably maybe a week. No. And somehow they had the power, they had the means of infiltrating all the governmental offices and uh, orders came down extremely speedily um, whether it was that you have to wear yellow armband or you have to wear yellow stars or you have to report here or you have to report there you couldn't do this certain businesses had to be closed and uh, so with one word the whole order as we knew it, it collapsed. No. And shortly after that, this was in March, about three or four weeks later, orders started to come in and it was designated ghettos where people are going to go. There were several ghettos, for instance, one in Kishwada, the other one in Niratyaza, the third one in Debrecen. Now, in vicinities where there was a concentration of Jews and uh, they selected certain towns and cities that these people are going to go there. And it was ordered what you can take with you. It was very minimal, some clothing, jewelry you, you had to turn in. You had to, every, everything what you had valuables. It was, you had to pack a sack or a suitcase and that was it. And sure enough, uh, about uh, three or four weeks after the occupation, you now it was horse and buggies, you know, distance from Bakta, Bakta and Haza to Kishwada, it was about 25 kilometer, what is 15, 16 miles. And uh, there was just like the wagon train, you know, the whole town was emptied to the last person, last Jew. And people, some of them were cheering, you know, that you are being taken away. Uh, I don't know. You can't say that uh, there may have not been one or two or a few of them who may have had some compassion, you know, because after all, we did have some friends too, close friends, who were Gentiles. We didn't live in a total environment of, uh, of atrocity all the time, you know. So some of the elder people, quite likely, may have felt some sorrow or some compassion, but uh, certainly there wasn't anyone that somebody could do something. Do you remember packing your belongings and yes. making decisions yeah. of what to take, yeah. what not to take? Yes, it was just just very personal, a few things, what, you took, what we took, some clothing, because we didn't know where we gonna go, and it was limited what you could take with you and certainly no variables would we have uh, been encouraged to take because if they did find some a gold piece or a gold watch or a gold ring or something like that you know uh, you could have been executed for that matter no and who were no. who were you with who went with you to the with me, my mother, sister, grandparents. Um, in that town, we had uh, um, my great grandmother, who was 
very close to a hundred. She didn't know it either how old she was, but uh, based on the facts what we had, she came from a neighboring little town. She was born in either 1848 or 49 in that, that period of time. She was, and we had some cousins and aunts and uncles. We, we settled in the ghetto in Kishwada. Uh, in Kishwada, that, uh, there was a huge section, several blocks. Primarily, it was Jewish occupied. Now, that, that one was a little city compared to Bakta, who was a small town. Has population close to 18,000, and there was three to 4,000 Jews, 1,000 families. It had a beautiful Jewish life with all the culture, all the, the, the sparkling beauty, whatever these things can give you going back centuries. Going back centuries, it's very your heritage was never denied, you know? and we had, uh, as far as uh, orthodoxy, everybody was orthodox, except there were some more religious, you know, you know? and uh, the ghetto was circled into an area where they put in, uh, I think to the best of my knowledge, we had 7,500 to 8,000 Jews gathered in that ghetto. That was, that consisted of the Jews of Kishwarda plus the vicinity for dozens of smaller towns. And each town had some of them a hundred, some of them two hundred, some of them three hundred, fifty, no. Was the synagogue People. a part Kishwada? of it? Yes. Yeah. The synagogue was part of it. Um, the synagogue housed probably hundreds, hundreds of people who stayed there during the, during the duration of the ghetto. <coughs> the benches had been taken out, and people were sleeping on cots or mattresses. Where did your family stay? Uh, we stayed in a room in one of the homes, but it was in, the, in between the area. No. And we did, we did stay different places because between grandparents, uncles, um, cousins, sister, mother, we were probably at least 40 people, so we had to be scattered all around. And that's where we got the first uh, true picture that what is, what life we are offer us in the future. No. Uh, there was a committee formed out of Jews. Now this was on the order of the Germans. There were Hungarian people who were administering the ghetto and they ordered a certain number of people, probably half a dozen people, who were the in-between, who were the liaison people between the commanders or administrators and the general population you know, of the ghetto. And uh, there were two German SS soldiers who were in total command. And there was many versions coming in. Nobody knew 
what is what. Everybody was, you know, were running in circles because we were fed false information. Not only that it was false, but it was deliberately false. Now they said, the youngsters, we're going to take two so-and-so in the black forest. There are factories. You're going to work over there. The mothers are going to go. It won't, every age group have been so-called categorized that this one is going to do this, that one to, is going to do that. And the only reason why they did this to keep the calm, you know, of the people. Because otherwise, who knows? Maybe there could have been an uprising. Maybe it couldn't have been. And, uh, but uh, we did have false and, I would say, deliberate false information. This is the end of tape number two. This is tape number three of the interview with Mr. Alexander Karp. You were talking about the misinformation. Yeah, in the ghetto. Uh, approximately three or four weeks after we entered the ghetto, we have been advised that the ghetto is going to be dissolved by virtue of taking transports and sending them to various different places to work. But during the time, we got some very, very dreadful messages, but it wasn't really verbal message. It was physical messages. We have seen which way people had been treated for the smallest little thing. They would take you to a certain area and under the supervision of the German soldiers, people would be beaten tremendously. Um, I think <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I, I personally have witnessed one. She wasn't a child anymore. She was uh, pretty close, probably in her 20s. She was somewhat uh, uh, there was some develop, development of problem. You know, and the way she was treated, it's, it's painful to talk about. So, but anything, whatever it was done, that somebody they didn't like, or it was done under, to the contrary, you know, all civil rights certainly has been suspended. Anyone could do anything what they wanted which. And this became a frightening situation. It became because if it can happen in your own place where you come from. No, after all, most of those people were born in Hungary. Most of them were the residents of Kishwada. The rest of them were in the vicinity. And any one person can impose on you his own will. Now it became very, very frightening. But there wasn't much we could do. Came the early part of uh, June or the latter part of May. I don't know the exact calendar day. The only thing I do remember, it was the second day Shavuos that uh, we were ordered to put ourselves together 
and tonight we are going to leave by train. So during the day, we march to the train station. By that time, we even, we had to leave most of the belongings, even what we took into the ghetto, because it was minimized how much you can take with you. So the only thing you did is a couple of extra shirts or uh, a pair of shoes. And before, before we went into the ghetto, I remember we went to the shoemaker and uh, we had them. Well, I want you to put triple soles. I mean, this is one incident, but it stays in my mind. I told them to put triple soles in my shoes because we don't know how long <laughs> we're going to be gone. We don't know what it may happen. And I want you, I want that the shoe so should last, you know. So they put a real heavy sole, probably three or four layers, you know. And I took that to the concentration camp. And it was a mistake because those are the ones where it comes loose the first uh, the quickest, the heavier the saw, it comes, it came loose. After I started to wear it, it was gone, you know. So, it was barefoot. And uh, so that second day of Shavuos, uh, they jammed us into cattle cars. And it wasn't a pretty sight. Nobody said much, but I can attest to that that everybody's heart was bleeding because you didn't want to be um, too sad or to, to show that how much perturbed you are because you didn't want your mother, you didn't want your sister to be uh, to be even more so. You wanted to show that, uh, hey, you are courageous, that things is going to be okay, confidence. No. But deep down, we knew that this is, this is probably the beginning of the end. So we didn't know which way even which way we're going to be going. So finally it was still daylight. We saw when the train left the station and we were approximately 120 to 150 people. Now these weren't the size of the cars. These were cattle cars, so called. They were small ones probably have the size than what you see over here, you know? And uh, as uh, time went on, it got dark. We next station, we know we were entering the Carpathian section, as you were asking me. Um, it was a, it was a ton what it was on the Czechoslovakian and Hungarian border, CHOP. No, that was the name of the city. We went over there, the train stopped. And from there we were going towards <coughs> known city, Košice. <coughs> and towards the, the Carpathian Mountains. The direction we were aware of it, that we are going towards the Polish border, going in. However, had no idea where to. No. So the following day, uh, during the day, it was hot. It was like a steam oven. No. I mean, that many people jammed into it. Window, 
Uh, I'm quite sure you have seen that before in your experiences. It was probably a 12 by 12 inch window on two sides. And if I'm correct, it was maybe four windows on the four corners, maybe a 12 inch, 12 by 12 inch. But it wasn't enough. It was hardly enough to get ventilation. No. Besides that, uh, they only had a few parts, you know, if somebody had to discharge something. No. No. As time went on, it became, it became horrible. No. Never forget, for many, many miles and hours, was sitting down on the floor and uh, I, my mother was sitting in front of me, and I had her head in my palm now. And without saying a word, just constant sobbing. I mean, what, what can you say? How do you, how do you encourage someone? How do you, how do you talk confidence into someone? sister was next to us, and uh, in the very same car. We had our close to a hundred years old great-grandmother. Her son, who was my grandfather, he was, uh, he was exactly the same age as I am now. Was no. And my grandmother no, it was I can't even describe it. I can find words for it. What that two days train ride did to you. I mean it's it's very hard to find find words for it. So, to eat, nobody even wanted to eat, because appetite was gone, there wasn't much, low bed what we took from the ghetto. And there were some youngsters, some small ones too, children, you know, who, who weren't able to recognize what really is going on. So some of them have been fed a little bit. Water was very scarce, you know. It was, uh, it was hell on earth. You know. So day was gone. We went into one extra night, and uh, I don't know who slept, if anybody, even one minute, other than children, perhaps, you know. That 48 hours was, first of all, the bouncing of the train. Sitting down, there were no chairs or couch toys, anything of the kind. And um, so we came in Wednesday morning, mid-morning. We pulled in to a place. S still didn't know where we are. And how could we be living in such a dark ages? Up until that day, never heard anything about Birkenau. I don't even know if we heard about Auschwitz, because Auschwitz somehow had a little more prominent uh, recognition. You know. But maybe that recognition came later, later around. You know. So we pulled in, and uh, we were embarking. No. It was turmoil. There were trains, some other tracks, other tracks, people coming, people going. So the, peop the guards who were assigned to us, you know, they were sort of 
role in keeping us in order. They were showing which way to go. You know? And as we were going, I know because we were told that Mengele was dead. You know? he, was, he, he stood in front of the gate. You know? And he was pointing with a, like a baton, you know, was pointing as he was looking without saying one single word. Um, he says, never said links or rechts, never said that, just pointing. Now, I, I, I believe this is what we were told, that he's, he was Mengele. For some reason, he wouldn't have been, he was just the same as he was. No. And that, that was the spot that I separated from my mother and my sister. And I was together with my uncle. Mm -hmm. And when my mother was walking away, she turned back and she called out to my uncle. And she said, like in a, uh, in a way, when you say to someone, no, uh, my dear Louis, take care of Shang, what is Alex? No. And that was the end, that was the last minute that I have seen them. And uh, that's where a new chapter of our life began. She went to her death without knowing about my father. No. That was, um, it's, uh, that picture somehow, it can never fade away. It's, we don't live with it on a daily basis. We don't think about it on a daily basis today. But the picture is always there. No? Your sister went with your mother? Yes. She was 50 years old. A anybody else? in the family? Hmm. My, sis my mother's sister, my aunt, she went with two children. Uh, her great-grandmother, I mean her grandmother, who was my great-grandmother, uh, she went with them. My grandparents, from both sides, with the exception of my paternal grandfather who passed away in 40, 41, 42, 42. My great-grandfather, he passed away in 41. And <coughs> I never forget that my Grandfather said that I think that God loved my father, you know, who was my great grandfather, said that he took his life and spared them from coming, from from this bef befalling on him. Yeah. That was the Then we entered the compound of the, of the concentration camp. Um, procedure, you 
usual procedure. Shaved you, undressed you totally, gave you that striped pyjama. He used some kind of disinfection. Disinfection is uh, some powder, whatever it was. And uh, he assigned us to a barrack. And once we were there, there were people from various different areas. Primarily, it was the Hungarian contingency at that time, because that was the time when the Germans were really pumping in Birkenau with the Hungarian Jews. Even though there were some people who were there permanently, they were from Poland, Lithuania. You know, there we started to meet some people. And uh, all of a sudden, we, came, we, we became wise to the fact that really what is going on. Um, that was the first time that we heard about crematorium and on the other side where we went there was a fenced in compound where the women were women and they were calling out to us, some of them in Hungarian, some of them were speaking Polish, some of them Yiddish, you know, and they were practically basically informing us what's going on you now. And the first thing what it uh, what it what it made me practically going insane the smell. No. Uh, couldn't figure out what it is. And in the background, towards the other area, uh, if we went to the left, towards the right, I've seen smoke coming up, raw smoke. And the flash fire I didn't see it, but the smoke stayed as it, as it was just like the house is on fire. No. Once we got into the ghetto area, we asked, oh, what is that? What is going on? No. This, was, uh, this was the second shock of your life. He said, the crematoriums cannot handle the bodies and they are putting them in, whether they were alive, some of them alive, some of them um, who were killed before they had a big pit, like a, and that's what they used as a substitute to crematoriums. And uh, there you how do you find words to express when your loved ones just went into that area? Can you have hope that maybe they're going to be spared? No? It's, it, it, was, it was driving you insane. No. No? But nevertheless, that little, tiny little bit of hope that the human being has, you know, there was always maybe, maybe. So you keep yourself going in order to, um, to come to, to realize whether somehow, sometimes, you're going to be able to face it, whether somebody survived or somebody, what happened, no? Because the easiest thing could have been is people today, for lesser things, they commit suicide. No? 
and many times other, other people have that chance. Hey, what do I need this life for? No? But uh, somehow we always have that tiny little spark, you know, that hope for life. And by not knowing what happened, on the other side, you know, my uncle, who was considerably older at the time, and perhaps even more matured, you know, said, look, he says, we just got to keep going. Because if we give up, that's the end. We'll never know what happened. So <laughs> daily life became in Birkenau, I wouldn't be right to say even pleasant to any degree, as we were jammed into and we were sleeping like herring. We, food was was practically nil. Every morning you had to come to the appeal. You know? The appeal was, they were counting the people, because they kept pretty good record how many, how many people is in that barrack, you know? whether it was raining or shining. Or, or, and sometimes you would be standing there for hours. And if somebody who didn't have the strength and sat down or fell out. You know, they were right there with their sticks and with their dogs, you know, and beat you or whatever it came to their mind. So a lot of things we didn't do during that four or five weeks or six that we spent there. Um, Primarily, what they had us do is pave with cobblestones the roads. As it was just simply mud, you know, sandy, sandy roads. And uh, that was pretty hard to do because by that time, your energy was gone. You know, and this is several months after the initial. Uh, introduction of the ghetto, you know, and the energy started to fade away. And you have seen things where it was going on, beatings. And by that time, we have seen people who were dying and they were being buried. And uh, uh, it, everything what is against humanity, it was taken place. You know. So. There was a um, there was a report that uh, you can uh, you can register to go to work if you have a trade. So my uncle and myself, we, we really weren't metal slifer. What is like a, a tool and die maker? No. He knew about bicycles because he was involved with uh, regular bicycles. So he knew how to put that together. He knew how to take it up. He says, let's go and let's report, let's register that we are, um, that we are metal schleifers. And I'm, we did. And sure enough, they assembled group of 500. Very few of them. Some of them we knew who they were, but some of them we didn't because they may have came, they may have come from Budapest or Miskolc or various different places. And word came that we are going to another camp and we are going to work in a factory. So anything less than less than being free, 
was better than to be in that camp. This is the end of tape number three. This is tape number four of the interview with Alexander Karp. So you and your uncle volunteered? Volunteered to go as a tool and die maker. And we were um, put into a group of 500 who were selected to go to a factory. We were told that we are going to a factory. Actually, we did not, not at that time. We were transported into a section of France, but it was the north, uh, northwestern part, uh, to a smaller town by the name of Thiel, T-H-I-E-L, close proximity to Villarapt. No? And we didn't know where we are. I mean, all these facts that, that we were in northern France and the northwestern part came to our understanding later. You know. At that time, we didn't know it. And it was basically a, a vacant piece of land. Um, there was no camp. The only thing we had was fenced-in area. And once we arrived, they brought some prefabricated barracks, and it didn't take long. It was put together, and that was our uh, that was our living quarters. Uh, there was several several barracks. Uh, I, w I would say probably half a dozen, because we did have roughly a hundred people in each one, you know. and everybody volunteered there to, for whether it was in camp working or going out of the camp under supervision. Uh, my uncle and myself, we volunteered to go to loading and unloading at the railway station. It was for two reasons. Because we figured if we're going to be away from the camp, we may have a little bit of a chance to bump into some of the French people or to get something, to get a cigarette or uh, a little food depending on the guard who was with you, how, how serious they were about these things. You know. Anyway, it went on for several weeks, and uh, life was uh, relatively uneventful. There was no sickness, there was nothing what, what we would say at that point, it would have been detrimental to any one of the inhabitants. No. Um, I had a, um, my number was 18 no 18040 in German I still recall I can memorize it I can hear it when the appeal was and when they were counting the people and the only thing they were reading were the numbers 18040 and the answer was Yavo. No. this is the way you reported it at that time, I mentioned earlier in our conversation, I was able and lucky to get into one of the barrack commandos and be his helper for a while. 
but I must have done something because I lost his grace. And he chased me out. He chased me to the point that uh, he kicked me and he was able to hit my backbone, but it's very tender and for weeks, months, it was a terrible pain. But there was nobody to go to to complain, so we just lived with that. And uh, we kept going further on to, to the station, and all through that uh, two or three months that we spent over there, this was my assignment and also my uncle's. No. And towards the beginning of September, to the latter part of August, beginning of September, we heard cannon shots. No. The advancing forces were somewhere close by, and we certainly did hope that somehow they would circle us, that they would not be able to transfer from one camp to the other camp. But very shortly, very shortly after that, when the sun started to become quite intense, you know, we had the orders that everybody put things together, whatever it is, because we are leaving the camp. Now, prior to that, I'm going to mention that group of couple, couple hundred, either two or three hundred. There was another fenced-in area with a couple of other uh, barracks, two or three barracks, and a group came in, and we were not permitted to communicate with them. We were definitely forbidden. But you always find and you always take risk. No. And we spoke to them, we are coming from here, just in general terms. They didn't say where they came from or where they are going. One morning we got up and they were gone. Didn't know where what happened to them, didn't know anything about it. And uh, many years later, um, when I was already in the U.S., before, for 10 years, I lived in Canada, and I met a young man. Um, in 1950. Through the years, we became very close friends. All through the 10 years, I was in Canada, and uh, through many, many years in the States. You know. And at one point in our conversation, it came up, concentration camp, and uh, ghetto, where you come from. He is not that far from Kishwar, but perhaps 30 miles away. You know. But we didn't know each other. And I happened to mention that I was in a small little camp in France for a while in Till by Villarov. He says, that's where I was. He says, in the 500 was his father who didn't survive, incidentally. He says, I was with the two, I, I don't remember at this point whether it was 200 or 300, no? So it was very exciting and interesting, and certainly had a lot to talk about, even though we weren't at the same time for any length of time. But I did find out, and this is why they were so secretive, because that group of people were working on the atomic bomb with von Braun. Uh, uh, he's the one who was in charge of it. And 
they were doing some kind of a work with the development of the atomic bomb, whether it was the heavy water or uranium, or whatever it was. But this was an interesting um, encounter. What's his name? Alex Rosenbaum, who lives in Windsor now. No. Uh, so at the early part of September, we were transported out of Tia. Our train started to go back towards Germany. No. We stopped at Karlsruhe. Um, it was and the war was still raging on, certainly, at that time. And there was an air raid siren, but it came on when we were stationed, when we were stopping at Karlsruhe. And uh, I remember that all the guards from the train, they ran for cover now. And we were thinking we, we couldn't escape because uh, there was nowhere to go, didn't know where you are, no organization behind you. And the first German who would have got you would have turned you in. So we stayed. The only thing is we were hoping that the train is going to be hit, regardless of who, who could be the casualty. So at least the train couldn't go any further. No. But the sirens went off. And we kept going on further. We ended up uh, about a uh, couple of days later in a small town close to Stuttgart, uh, roughly 50 kilometers, what is about 30 miles. It's very close proximity to Heilbrunn, H E I L B R O. O N. Now, the town was called Kochendorf, and the camp was already there with several thousands of people. It was a big camp. We were put up in barracks, and from day one, conditions were terrible. It wasn't the same as we knew in France. No. No. Our living quarters, food, working conditions, punishments, anything you did, anything you did, you were at a risk that something could happen to you. So we tried to acclimate ourselves with the conditions. And for about a week or so, we were just roaming around. Then we registered again with the administrative uh, office to go to work as a tool and die maker. What we originally we tried to be. And they put us into a group of people who were going into a factory where it was about five kilometers from the camp. And we had to walk daily in and out back and forth. Uh, it was a huge complex. It had to be a, a to be some kind of manufacturing plant because it was a salt mine, a huge salt mine underground. And that salt mine was converted into a airplane parts factory. And that's where we were assigned. And we liked it, even though it took a lot of 
hours, because it took us about two hours to get there, two hours to come back. And it took quite a bit of time, because there were three elevators, and each elevator held only eight people. And one shift was going down, the, I mean, one elevator was going down, taking the people down, the other one was bringing them up. Mm -hmm. But this was, we used that to our advantage, because there was a huge, um, um, like a boiler, you know, you have these uh, ceramic boilers. It's made made out of uh, like a, like in a steel plant. You have these big big kazans, big fireplaces, and on top of it, we could lay down. It was nice and warm. And we tried always to go down with the last elevator. No? So we could have an, uh, at least another hour time to lay in the heat. No. And when we were coming up, we tried to get always to the first elevator, no. bringing up. Because only eight people could go, so it took at least an hour to take our group down. They took an hour to get it up. This went down for several, several months. <coughs> and during this time, as we were marching to the place of work, we went through orchards, no. No. apple tree, pear trees, uh, plum trees. In winter time, some of them were covered with ice, with slush, and our guards were Wehrmacht, weren't SS. And there was a couple of them who were somewhat compassionate, somewhat soft-hearted. And he could, he would let us pick up an apple, he would let us to pick up uh, a pear, whatever it was, whatever it was accessible. And that came really good because food was very scarce. As time went on, no, probably the war effort is, was getting uh, more critical. No. <coughs> Anything we were able to procure it meant life. No. So I, I do remember occasionally that uh, he, he probably was 60 years old at that time. Nice little, nice smiling face. He would even point at times. He says, go and pick it up. No. No. It happened. It was more of an exception than the rule. No. So weeks, months went by. There was one particular episode that truly, probably my life depended on it, that uh, occurred with me. While we were waiting for the elevators to take us down, no. No. And there were people who were coming up, there were people who were going down, and it was still the way I figured that probably another hour before my turn will come to go down. And behind this compound, there was a huge orchard full with fruit. And I snuck out from that place, from that gathering place. And I ran down to the, uh, to the orchard. I climbed up on a tree. I tied up my slacks, but it was the pajama slack. <coughs> tied up my slack. 
and I filled up both sides with <coughs> apples. Had them probably all the way up to my knees. No. All of a sudden, I hit the air raid siren. Now, once the air raid siren is on, they close every door, and you can't, you couldn't be caught outside. Now, you couldn't be caught outside anyway, but let alone during air raid siren. No. So, as I was up on the tree, I don't know what saved me. I jumped. I didn't care about the branches. I didn't care about anything. And one of uh, the, uh, one of my slack came loose. And as I was running, the apple was falling off. I felt terrible about it, that my, <laughs> that I'm gonna lose those apples. The other one was still holding on, no? And by the time I got to the door, I got to the gate. There was about this much room. And the guard who was closing it tells me, of course, in German, where, where were you? I tell him, he says, please. And my uncle was right next to him. And somehow he, he, pushed, that as, he pushed that aside a little bit, the two doors. And I was able to squeeze in. The guard tells me, says, where were you? Then look, I gotta be honest with you. I snuck out, I went down to the orchard, and I tried to get some apples. He says, you know, you can't do that. Says, but if you are caught outside, as you are shot on the spot. I know, he says to him, and somehow it came to me that thought. And I says, I wanted to ask permission from you, but you are probably tired, just as we are, and you fell asleep. I didn't want to wake you. Now, I put a little bit the emphasis on him too because he's not supposed to fall asleep. So he, whether he bought it or not, I don't know. The only thing I can say is that uh, at that moment when I was outside, my life wasn't worth a wooden nickel, as we call it. Because if I'm caught outside where there were plenty of guards outside, on the spot they should have uh, shunned. So this was something that uh, I can't wash out from my mind because uh, so, so I went back, we went to work and we kept going back and forth to this place. And uh, there for several episodes down there in the mines, you know, it was wet, damp, cold. And you were very susceptible of getting head colds and so forth. What we did is we were using for insulation newspaper. That was the best insulation, putting in our shoes and our bag. And that helped quite a bit. No. And one time we tried to sneak away and try to get a little bit of rest because these charades were 14, 15 hours, even though we only worked eight or nine, but by going, coming, going down and up, you know, it was the better part of the day. So whenever you could, you would take a little snooze, or <laughs> and I was caught once. They gave me ten lashes with a wire, <laughs> and you know, my 
and as they were hitting just by instinct, I would always put my hand over there. And uh, once it got cut my hand, you know, and with that thin wire, it was painful. But again, who, what you are lucky you considered yourself that you only got lashes rather than doing something else with you. No. So through the winter it was it was bad. Food was getting even more so scarce. So at one day our in our in our barrack they needed volunteers to empty the containers from night. No. We were four hundred people in one huge barrack. And there was only limited containers. So the smell and everything what it goes with that it was uh, was horrible. But my uncle and myself we volunteered. There weren't too many volunteers either because it was a uh, it wasn't too good of a job. In the morning, we, we had to empty those containers. And what was happening, especially towards the winter, towards the fall, you know, if the ground was frozen, you could walk straight. You know. But if it was a little bit soft, you know, there was ice, and you tipped, you know, that container tipped and it splashed you. No. But we put up with everything because for this we got four extra plates of soup. No. We went on with that for as long as we could because that extra four and many times the container what they were carrying, you know, the food in it, and something was left, they would give it to you. And because we volunteered, we did this job. You know, sometimes we had enough that we could give to other people, to friends, and to other else. So, but they already. Terrible things were happening. People were stealing each other's bread. People were st father went against son. Son went against father. The animal instinct started to come out in people. This is the end of tape number four. This is tape five of the interview with Alexander Karp. You were saying that things with food and with had gotten yeah, it, it, it gotten worse by the week, by the month. Um, people were stealing each other's food at night. You know, because um, in the evening we got a portion of bread, and sometimes part of that bread was kept for following morning, because in the morning you only got some liquid. So you put it under your pillow or whatever it was, and people would take it during the night. So it, it, it became more uh, cannibalistic. No. And a uh, couple of things what happened uh, in particular, it stays with me for all through these years. Um, there were some Gentile Russian, uh, um, or they may have been Ukrainian, but 
oh, I believe they were Russian uh, soldiers or partisans. No. No. And a couple of them escaped from the camp. They were at Kochendorf. They were caught outside, brought them back, and they hung them. Everybody had to stay. It was like an exhibition. You know. We had to watch at the whole camp. You know. And this was the only time, the first time, and the only time that I have seen a hanging. It's a horrible sight. He put a rope over his neck, they knocked out a bench, and, and it seemed like that his body, it stretched like from six feet to ten feet. The only thing but he cried out, and I couldn't understand at the time where I didn't speak Russian, but some who did said his last words were, long live my motherland. No. So uh, there wasn't too much of a chance for escapes or for anything, uh, anything of that kind. Then one other occasion, what we were doing, the kitchen was in the middle of the camp and towards the side of the fence, but it surrounded the camp. And behind that, probably about 15 feet of gap between the cyclone fence and the building, it was left open space where they were throwing out the potato peels, the remnants, or vegetable, whatever it was. And the two end of the building was also fenced off. So nobody could go behind, behind the building and pick up perhaps some of these, whatever it was thrown out. And what we used to do is when guards were preoccupied or didn't, we took some chances and we went in and put through our hands through the cyclone and we were pulling out the potato peels. Next day, we went some part of the camp and we would make a little bonfire and cook it or burn it or you know, roast it. At one time, not far from my hometown where I come from, he was from the Romanian part of that area. Now, both of us, where it was dusk, it was starting to get dark, and uh, both of our hands were inside. All of a sudden, we hear one shot you now from the tower, but it was towards the corner of the camp, and he was shot right there, dead next to me, just because we had our hands. So Certainly, I couldn't be fast enough to pull my hands out and lay down on the ground and crawl away, because this depended on the guards. You know? Some god, even if he has seen it, he have not said anything. But if you found some, he didn't like it. You know? That was the end of it. I never went back again. So we were there till about March of the uh, following year. 1944, and um, um, the Allies started to cut off supply lines. It wasn't, they couldn't commute quite that well. So we heard words that we are being transported from Kochendorf, from this camp, and we're gonna be going to Dachau. Mm -hmm. so they put the groups together. Who is gonna go by train 
and who is going to go by marching. You know. I happened to come on a train, and my uncle, he was selected to go with the marchers. You know. The train started out, it was cold days here. You know, in the Boyerish Mountains, you know, it, end of March, early part of April, it's still very cold. And it was open, open car. No. We, we, we didn't know which way we are going. Remember we stopped at one station in Ulm, U-L-M, Ulm. And I saw a train, it had Hungarian markings on it. So we started to call out Hungarian to them, and one person came over. They were still in the military, and we told them that we are coming from a concentration camp. We are being taken to Dachau. Please give us some food. So he brought over one, one loaf of bread, you know, but with several of the people, you know, we, uh, we sliced it up, and uh, it was Probably everybody had one bite. No. So train started out, and we got into Dachau. Mm -hmm. It was in a turmoil, coming, going. Then, so we were ordered to go and take a bath. No. And once we went into that heated bath, um, Only really the living a few people who had some energy at because I want to touch base on several of, of those days, a couple, two or three days. It was so cold that probably half of the people who were on that train in open cars died, came into Dachau dead. Because the exposure to the weather, malnutrition, weakness, just it was total demise to the point that people, including myself, you know, we covered ourselves with dead bodies just for survival. You know. was, uh, by that time, probably we were closer to animal instinct than human instinct. So when we came into Dachau, the, the people who were left alive and who survived that trip, that four-day trip, the whole thing was 120 kilometers, what is 80 miles. It took us four days to get there. But several of them, the ones who were taking the shower, probably heart attack or who knows for what reason. Half of those people died in the shower. No. So we were assigned to barracks, and in Dachau we didn't do anything already because uh, the whole military system, the whole German apparatus was already crumbling. But they still spent enough emphasis on killing the Jews. No? Um, I must uh, inject into it one thing what happened with the group, with the marches where my uncle was, was in. They came in without him, and that totally devastated me, because I made it through with him for most of that year. And truly, if it wouldn't have been him, his maturity and his persistence and his uh, durability, you know, I don't know if I would have made it very doubtful. So certainly, it, it upset me tremendously. And 
couple of weeks went by, and once uh, someone who I knew and he knew, both of us, came and told me, says, I saw your uncle, he's in barracks so and so, I didn't want to believe my ears, let alone seeing him, no. And thank God, luckily, he made it. In short, what he did, he, f he escaped from his group. He was hiding in a farm, in a barn. And after a while, they, the Germans, they said he has to go because they were afraid themselves. He says, if we're going to be caught, he says, all of us are going to be there. So he joined an another marching group, and with that one, he came into M Munich. So we were there till probably the 1st of May or 2nd of May. And they evacuated Munich, I mean Dachau. And uh, we went by train to the German-Austrian border close to Innsbruck, to a little town named Mittenwald. They embarked us, and we were literally speaking out in the fields on our river bank in the fields. There were hundreds, hundreds, if not thousands and thousands of people. No? They were concentrating into that area, bringing from the camps the people in. And there too, no food. You understand? I don't even know what we ate. No? Because for several days there was no food being brought. No? But every single day or night it was snowing. And we were lying down. We procured somewhere some blankets you know, in the camp yet in Dachau. And we had those blankets and we covered ourselves up to our neck. Only our face was a little bit open for breathing. Um, but each morning, less and less people got up. So as the living got up, we had plenty of supply for blankets from the dead. No. Uh, I would say that 80% of the living people who went to that concentrated area didn't make it. No. And we didn't know which way the war is going. We didn't know what is going on. We knew that something is something is going on. No. We think one morning we got up and we didn't see any guts. Nobody. No. no, whoever had a little bit of strength to walk around or to ask questions. Look, there's no guts. The war must be over. So we started to walk in towards the little village. But it wasn't over because we still heard some gunshots. So there was still some house to house fight, except our guards left us. Probably they changed their clothes. They didn't want to be known as concentration camp guards or even soldiers. They went in, they put on civilian clothes, and that's it. Nobody asked them questions anymore. So we camped in a house where we walked in. It was vacant, empty. The inhabitants probably left for they were afraid of the Americans or for whatever reason. And we didn't want to take chances and to be downstairs or in the rooms. We went up in the attic. The attic was full with hay to feed the cattle or calf, whatever they had. And whatever food we found in the house, we took it upstairs. And 
we covered ourselves, we, we dug ourselves into it up to our neck in the hay, haystack. And that kept us beautifully warm, you know, because, and I think it gave us enough energy that we were able to maneuver these two or three days. But gunshots, yes, we did have, uh, for a couple of days, we looked out on cracks. We could see a German soldier, hear German, and perhaps we didn't know it, they were Americans, but we knew it was enemy soldier. You know? So about two or three days later, all these shootings quieted down, wait, waited one more night, and next morning opened up the attic door, and we tried, we heard some sound, and we tried to make it out, what could that be? Well, it wasn't German. Had it been German, we would have understood it. No, it wasn't German, so we figured it has to be either the Americans or English or French or whoever. So we came down, and sure enough, uh, the Americans occupied it. No? But we didn't go outside. We didn't care about the occupation either. We just stayed inside. And uh, my uncle started to cook a little bit. You know? All of a sudden, with that stomach, what we had, you know, cooked food, and we kept eating whatever we could. And that was a terrible mistake, because uh, we didn't regulate our intake. And it gave us from diarrhea, you name it, stomach ache, that it was unbelievable. It lasted several days. And um, probably a week later or so, the people who owned that place came back. They wanted, wanted to put us out. said, we are not going. They called the MP, American, I guess, who have to go. No. So we left and we went to the station. We got on a train, went into Munich. But at least we were liberated. No. At that time, I mean, we knew the war was over. It was May 9th when it was announced that the war was over. And this had to be mid-May or towards the end of May, May 20th. We were free, but free from what? Free of what? No? Um, went into Munich. We are at the station. And we were trying to find some kind of transportation to go back towards Hungary and see who came back, if anybody. No. But there was a group of people, primarily they were um, Polish uh, survivors, and uh, we asked one of them, where are you going? We are going to Israel. He says, come on on the train. We need everybody. No. So we got on the train, and not thinking about anything at that point. And we ended up in Modena, in one of the military compound. It was, uh, I don't know which Jewish organization, but Zionist organization was overseeing these, uh, these groups and was soliciting people to go to Israel. No. We were in Modena for probably a couple of months. We didn't hear anything about anyone. So we were quite sad about that. He says, somebody, somebody must have come back. No. So we decided with my uncle that we're going to go back to Budapest. And after that, We'll see what's going to be. No? And the train went back. We stopped in, uh, in Venice, Trieste, Ljubljana, but it's uh, in 
formerly Yugoslavia, Serbia, and went back to Budapest. By that time, some people started to come back, and there were several people who got liberated when the Russians occupied some sections of Europe, and they were freed by January instead of May. No. So there was some activity. And uh, we went to the, where the Jewish Federation occupied the building, and there were all kind of news, uh, information. People were putting up, uh, it was markers, I'm looking for this one, I'm looking for the, you know, all kinds of information. And I happened to come across um, my father's name. So my blood stopped for a moment, flowed. You know. And uh, sure enough, he was on his way back from Russia. He went to the place where he was originally recruited, and uh, he was released and didn't know where can you meet, where you gonna go, to the place of your home, where you left. Went back to Bakhtalor and Haza, and about a day or two later, my father came back. That's where we met up. No. And then started the, started the rebuilding. Now, in the early years, um, what do you do? We found out that hardly anybody came back. No, here and there an uncle came back and maybe a cousin. No, my father, who wasn't in concentration camp, he came back, but the great majority of our family really was lost. No. From young to old, from age, uh, age how old? Maybe the youngest one may have been two years old, three years old, you know, all the way up to a hundred. All these things was gone. I mean, and it's not something that you are able to replenish. It's, you know, it, it's, uh, it was very sad. And uh, you try to put the pieces together. We stayed on in Hungary for a couple of years, uh, 45, 46, about three years. My uncle went to Israel. And I was there for <coughs> about six more months. And I left Hungary, went to Vienna. And uh, from Vienna, went to Salzburg. And in Canada, I had five uncles. So I tried to find my way towards Canada. And uh, this is where we started to rebuild our life. What happened to your father? My father, he stayed on in Hungary, and he got married just before I left in 49. He got married and in Kishwarda to a lady who I happened to know even before my father knew her because I went with who are my brother and sister today. I went to school with them you know, in Kishwada. And they were, they lived till 1955. In 55 they migrated to Sydney, Australia because my stepmother's children went to Sydney from Vienna. So they 
oriented themselves towards uh, Australia. And uh, we didn't see my father till 1959. That was the first year when he came to the U.S. <coughs> that was after my wedding. And uh, while I was in Canada, I was single. And I met my wife, Gabby. And all the things that it has happened to you, and it's certainly no consolation for it. Nothing can pay for it. But this is the only one thing that the best came out of it. I would have probably never met her if we didn't pay this price. No. She lived in the States. She lived in Detroit. And she couldn't come over to Canada. I couldn't migrate to the States. So for approximately a year and a half, two years, we were engaged. But I found a way to come into the States. And in 1959, January 31st, that's the day when I, when my visa stamped in to come in to the States. And next day, we were married. It was planned. No. This is the end of tape number five. This is tape number six of the interview with Alexander Karp. So you had just gotten married. Yeah. Yeah. Settled in Detroit, Michigan that time and started to put our pieces together as we knew it the way it was. And I must admit and be grateful to someone like Gabby, who is my wife, and who has given through the years the support, encouragement, in whatever shape and form I wanted to carry the legacy on. Uh, she's a remarkable woman, and uh, again, without her, probably I couldn't have reached the plateau as we are today, as we have it today. And besides that, we have two beautiful sons who are married, each one of them. We have two girls. No. They have given us a lot of joy, a lot of naches, because they were brought up and they were willing to be brought up in the tradition as we have known it from years past. And hopefully with, with those kind of commitments, these generations is going to go on and on in the very same tradition as we have left off. Now, I do want to make some mention whom I have spoken before, my uncle, who resides presently in Haifa. He's a, that, uh, he's, uh, he was instrumental of to my survival, because without him, it would have been quite difficult, quite difficult to 
for me as a youngster, I may have not had the, the courage to go on and to go through whatever difficulty we were facing. So I'm very grateful to him, and I wish him many, many more years and long life. No. What's his full name? Uh, Louis Nahum Klein. My father, who resided in Sydney, he has traveled many times to visit us. So that has somewhat eased the pain a little bit. But truly, nothing can compensate for whatever it happened. It's only a partial. Uh, it's, it's, how should I say it? It's very difficult to find words for that, but for what we paid for, what we have today, there is no way that anyone could justify it ever. No those human losses. Uh, it was uh, so tragic that hopefully the present generations will learn and be either preempted or never let it happen again. To this effect, we locally, there is a group of people are the Sharatha Plata, survivors of uh, the Holocaust. And we have commemorated with the Holocaust Museum what is uh, really a museum. It's an educational center. It is something what it was, uh, what it makes us understand what it was before, what it was during, and what it was after the Holocaust. So I can only hope and pray that nothing even in close proximity, nothing not only to Jews, but to anyone on this earth that it should never happen. Mr. Cole, mm -hmm. this has truly been a privilege. I want to thank well, you. I want to thank, I want to thank you for your patience <coughs> and to the extremely skilled audio, audio video audio video operator and uh, most of all I want to say thank you to Steven Sil Spielberg. I mean it is absolutely it is uh, remarkable it's it's unbelievable what that man has created and uh, I hope that he's going to find long, long, long life in good health, and he's going to be able to do a lot of things like this. Now, Mr. Karp, I see that you are surrounded by family, and you have a phone in your hand. I know your son David couldn't be here today. Uh, he's on the phone, and maybe he wants to say something to you. Hello. Hi, David. <laughs> I, sorry that you couldn't be here today, but uh, 
you are still in our heart and all of you and if you have anything to say we're gonna be happy to hear that Thank you, David. Hello. Yeah. Thank you, Ada Shapa. Love to Judy and to you, Lindsay and Daniel. And we just wish you could have been here. But believe me, we love you. We love all of you. And you are, you are here with us. Thanks, David. Would you introduce us? Oh. To the woman at your left? The, the woman at my left is my wife, <coughs> who I, I truly I have no words, because anything what I would want to say what is in my mind it would last probably longer than you could afford to be it. But I just want you to know that she was the greatest gift of my life. And she's a wonderful wife, mother, grandmother, whatever a person, and she's very instrumental of carrying on 
but a world we were accustomed to in our own ways. And uh, without her, I don't think I could carry the legacy on. So I just want you to know we all love you very much. Thank you. And to to, left. to the left of to the left of Gabby, it's Beth who came to be part of our family about eight or nine years ago and uh, has blessed us with a couple of children. And it has given us new perspective in life. No, that uh, as we say the shattered life has been somewhat put together and uh, we can't ask for anything more to my right is my son Gary doesn't need no introduction he's, uh, he's been a wonderful child wonderful young adult and certainly even more wonderful grown-up family. Um, he has given us through the years a lot of joy, never any trouble, and for that we are very grateful for him and we wish him for many, many years long and lasting life together with his family and he he only should see joy nachas and good health love you anybody like to say anything and let me say a couple of words to the grandchildren no we love them Love and both. Okay. Oh, no. Love you. Give Papa a kiss. Love you. Love. Love. Yes. Oh, thank you. I just. I would like to say just a couple of words. How very mm-hmm. proud I am of my husband. Thank God he survived the Holocaust oh. and gave me and gave us. Wonderful, wonderful life. Two beautiful sons, two wonderful, wonderful daughter-in-laws, and four grandchildren. And I'm just very proud of them, and I love them very much. Thank you. I'd like to add a few words. You know, it's very difficult in just a few short moments to sum up a lifetime. And I guess that if I could say anything, I'm more than emulating everything that my father has done. You know, as the old saying goes, sometimes you only hope that you know as much as he's forgotten. And our generation is fortunate in that the atrocities that came before us are behind us. And we hope to keep it that way for the rest of our lives and for the rest of time. But probably the biggest and the best gift that he could give us is by doing what he did today. Because we're here to hear it firsthand. But as I, as I look at my children, Jamie and Allison, and whoever else might come along, whatever else, and as time goes on, it's something that they're going to read about, something that they're going to hear about, And this is probably the closest connection that they're going to have down the road where they can see, they can see their grandfather, their great grandfather. And they can hear it firsthand. They don't have to read about it. They don't have to read about the history. And I can only tell them that I I love them more than words can tell.
sun just come? Um, these are my grandfather, grandmother, Jenny, and Ada of Klein, my aunt Belus, who never came back from the Holocaust. Next to her is my uncle in Haifa, Louis Klein, Nahum Klein, and uh, my aunt Margaret, who lives in Los Angeles. Um, this picture is of my parents and myself, Mariska and Ignaz Karp, taken in 1929. Uh, this picture is taken of my aunt who perished in the Holocaust, Belush Klein, married to Ignaz Schwartz. Uh, these pictures are four of my mother's brothers. They lived during the Holocaust in Canada. So luckily they were able to survive without losing any one of them. Uh, namely, Harry Armin Alex and Bill, and Harry's son, Ernie. This is, this is my sister, Marta, who perished in the Holocaust. Uh, she was 15 years old, born in 1929. is my father, <coughs> Ignaz Karp. He has survived the Holocaust due to the fact that he was in Russia. Came back in 1945 and passed away May 4th, 1990 in Detroit, Michigan. This is our wedding picture, 1959, Gabby and Alex Kapp. Okay. Uh, this picture was taken in Sydney, Australia. My father, who was married in 1949, they moved to Sydney. I visited them, because who is my stepmother, even though she's my stepmother, but um, she treated and she handled us. She was a wonderful woman. I mean, she treated us like uh, any mother would, would treat their own natural child. And may her memory be, be blessed. These are David and Judy and their children, Lindsay and Danielle, um, our precious little grandchildren. Uh, this picture is of four of our grandchildren, namely Lindsay, who is David's, um, Jamie, Garris, um, Daniel, David, and Allison Garris, um, and their wives, David's wife, Judy, and Garris's wife, Beth. 
Uh, this was the secular school in Kishwarda, what we attended. It was primarily a Jewish school with only Jewish children and uh, Jewish teachers. This is the great synagogue in Kishwarda. It was one of the most beautiful and well attended synagogues in the vicinity. And uh, I remember Kol Nidre evenings. I mean, it was like even the air was holy. No, that's the way people have uh, conducted themselves, attended the synagogue, and uh, it brings back a lot of memories. This is the end of the videotaping session. We used six tapes. <laughs>